Hi there, welcome back to the Dev All. I am Roman and this is the event sourcing do-it-yourself video series. Finally, in this episode, we are going to write some code. We are going to write a query handler and we are going to implement our first queries in our system. But before we can actually start with this, I need to show you some changes I made to the application. I rearranged some files, I brought some more structure into our code, and we are going pretty briefly over all this stuff. So, los geht's! All right, let's jump into the code. So first of all, I want to fix two things that were all right for the first season, but as the program grows, they will become quite cumbersome to work with. So the first thing is the way we are calling our program. All the logic resides within our main function here in the program FS file, and there is no interactivity at all. So when I want to run it, I need to call .NET run. And when I want to run it again, I need to call it again. And when I want to change just one value within our workflow, within our the stuff we are doing, I need to call .NET run again. And obviously this is not scaling very well and it's not very realistic. A solution for this would be to implement some kind of user interface. And this is exactly what we're going to do. The second thing we notice here is that everything we wrote up to now lives in just one file, this programfs file. And this was fine for the beginning, but now that we are extending our program more and more and more, it makes a lot of sense to split things up and also hopefully to clean things up a bit. So let's start with the user interface. I decided to build a semi-interactive interface based on the most beautiful foundation I can think of, the Windows command line. It is semi-interactive in the sense that we want to define all the possible actions up front and later we are able to actually choose between them. So down here in the code we start the menu and we pass all the available sub-menus, which are the event history, our queries, our commands, and some utilities. And up here, we see all the options we have in such a submenu. And as you can see, we still use the event store directly in here as we did before. And over the course of this series, we will actually replace those with command handlers, query handlers, etc. So let's have a look at our working application. Beautiful, isn't it? We see here our options. We can check the current history in total and for both of our tracks, and we can call the behavior of the application, and we see that this then results in new events. In here, we can call our queries, which for now are just direct projections from the event store, but this is what we're going to change in this episode. Let's switch to the directory structure. As you can see here, our program is much shorter now. Only the command line interface definitions, the program definitions, and some helpers are still in here. And we are opening a couple of namespaces, which are defined in their own files. Disclaimer, this is just some structure that fitted the current state of the project well. Nothing is fixed in here and everything can be changed as we learn more about our domain and about event sourcing. So all the behavior and the projection can be found in the domain.fs file. And the test belong in its own file as well. The rest is put into the infrastructure folder. Here we find the necessary types within the infrastructure namespace and the event store got its own file as well. As you can see, I changed the type, the name of the type from aggregate to event source. And I had a couple of reasons for this. And first of all, the term aggregate comes from an object-oriented world in which we had a class that is the entry point for some behavior and that protects its own constraints. This is different in a more functional approach. Here, aggregates live more on the conceptual level because we do not have those, those roots as entry points. We only have functions that work together. And furthermore, there can be cases in which we need a bit more flexibility with the source of our events. 
and we do not want to use the strict corset an aggregate puts us into if we do not need it. Therefore, I chose the term event source. It is the source for the events that happened in our system and can be used to find the events that are belonging together conceptually. Cool. Now that we have done all this housekeeping stuff, let's have a look at our CQRS diagram again. What we are going to build now is this part of the application here. We want to build the query part and for this we need a query handler. So we still have the user interface, we still have a client that is able to send queries to our system and it expects some results as an answer. And the question is what can the answer actually look like? Well, in our case, it could be a real result. So the system could be actually able to handle the query. On the other hand, the system might not have been able to handle the query. Or another possibility would be that some kind of error could have occurred. So the question is now, who is answering the given query? And in this system that we're going to build, it is our entry level query handler. But this query handler does not really know anything about the queries our system is able to handle. It rather knows the query handlers it was initialized with. So when a query is incoming, it asks each of those handlers one by one if it is able to actually handle the query. And if a handler is not able to handle the query, the next query handler is asked. And if one handler says that it handled the query and provides a result, this result is then returned to the client and no more handlers are asked. So the first query handles that handles the query always wins. And in the end, if no query handler is actually able to handle the query, this not handled result is also returned to the client. So our system was not actually able to handle the result. So let's actually build all this now. All right, let's write some code. So the first thing that I always want to do is to talk about the API. And in a functional language, most of the time, the API can be defined by the types. So the first thing that we're going to do is to add the new types that work as the contracts within our system. So first of all, we define a type for our query result. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is what kind of information does a client need as an answer for a send query? So the client wants to know um, whether a query was either handled, not handled, or if we had a query error. So for example, an exception occurred. So, and in our case, the information within these query error is a string with the information about the error. Not handled means that the query handler for a given query was not available within our system. And if a query was actually handled, we also need to tell the client about the actual results. So the question is, what type should this result have? And I have to admit that I chose the easy way here. So I went with object so we can put anything into this. So, but this means that later the client needs to actually know what kind of type it expects and it has to cast or work with it accordingly. If later we choose to switch this type to JSON or some other kind of serialization, we could use this instead here as well. All right, let's switch then to the actual query handler of our, of our system. So this handler can work with some kind of query. This query is going to be defined later on. So no panic for now. And for now, it has only one functionality. It handles a query. So handle is a function that takes a query and returns a query result. But we said that we do not want to block the whole system. So we return an asynchronous query result, which manifests in the type async of query result. Cool. So let's make this a bit bigger here for you so that you can actually see this hopefully. Okay, now let's build the entry level query handler for our system. So let's switch back to the diagram. You see here, this is the entry level query handler. So this is the entry level um, handler that knows other query handlers 
but this is completely transparent to the client. So we create this query handler in our infrastructure. And similar to the event store that we already built, our query handler has an initialize function that returns our ready to use handler. So we return a record that has the single handle function as defined in, in the type. The initialize function takes a list of query handlers and whenever a query comes in, it asks the query handler or it asks each query handler one by one who wants to handle the query. It does this with the help of a choice function that we are going to define in a second. So, of course, this choice function takes a list of query handlers and it also takes a query. And to actually be able to implement this then, we pattern match over the list of handlers and when this list is not empty, we ask the first handler in the list whether it can actually handle the query. Remember that this is also a query handler and so it has a handle function that takes a query and it returns a query result. So what kind of answers can we get in this query result? Well, we have just defined it. So the answer can be not handled, handled and query error. And when we get an error, the choice function also returns this error. And when we get a real result, the result of the choice function is also this real result. But when the handler was actually not able to handle the query, we try the next ha query handler in our list by calling the choice function recursively again with the rest of the list and the given query. And of course, when we want to do this, when we need to call our function recursively, we also need to mark our function as recursive. Now we see here that we have an incomplete pattern matching. And of course, the case of an empty list is missing. So what does an empty list mean? Well, of course, we could not handle the query because no given query handler was actually able to do it. So then we tell the client, sorry, we were not able to handle your query correctly. Now we have still some errors. Let's have a look. So in order to actually be able to fix those, let's have a look at the type again of the choice function. So the type or the, the choice function returns a query result. But we defined that our query handlers actually return an asynchronous query result. So how do we fix this type error? The solution in F sharp is to wrap the whole function body in an async computation expression. Now, whatever is returned from the expression body is wrapped in an async by F sharp and can be run asynchronously. In fact, nothing is done when we only return it like this. So we only return a description of what will happen when this asynchronous block is run later in time. But now that we have done this, now that we have actually used the computation expression, we need to use the return keyword to actually return from our computation expression. So whenever this is used, the return value is then wrapped in an async. But as you know by now, the handle function also returns an async of query result, but we need the actual query result. And to actually resolve this and wait for the result, we need to use the so-called bang syntax. So instead of match here, we just say match bang with the exclamation mark. And this is similar to, a, to an await in C sharp or in JavaScript. And when we have done this, we can pattern match as usual. Now, the last question is, how do we actually return in the recursive case? Because as you have seen, choice already returns an async. And I have said that return wraps the value in an async. So we had async of async of query result, which would not work. And it would not even compile. So in this case, we can also use the bang. We just say return bang, which tells F sharp not to wrap it again because it already is an async. So now, now all branches return the same type, async of query result and everything compiles. So 
this was a whole lot and if you're new to this whole async stuff in F sharp or computation expressions in general, I have a plan to have some introductory videos about this in the future, but they are not there yet. So for now, I just put a couple of links in the description of this video. To finish this up, this query handler, one final word about partial application. So as you know, the handle function takes a query and returns an async of query result. And as you can see, we use the choice function for this. The choice function has two parameters, query handlers and query. And we only apply one parameter, namely the query handlers. And this results in a new function that knows about those handlers and needs one more parameter, which is a query. And it returns an async of query result. And this is exactly what we want. Mm -hmm.